Good evening. Let's stand together. Good evening. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. It is good to give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good to give thanks to the Lord our God. Lord, we're thankful for your word. We remember tonight, even with anticipation, how good and pleasant it is Lord, to be together with the body of Christ, with you as our foundation, Lord, with you as the center of attention. God, we come to commune with you, and we're so thankful that you're here already. You greet us, Lord. You welcome us. Your grace invites us to come, Lord, and just enjoy what you died for us to receive, and that is fellowship with you. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. Thank you for your blood, which washes us clean from all sin, forgives those who ask, and reconciles them, makes them right with God. Lord, invite us to come right now. Lord, and if there's sin, if there's something in the way, Lord, just would your spirit convict us so we can repent specifically and just enter in, God. Draw us closer to you, we pray tonight, than we ever have before. Lead us in worship. Prepare us for your word, God. We just pray that you would um, have more of us tonight. You'd be a bigger part of our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Make us a thankful people, as we said last Wednesday, God. Filled with thankfulness, Lord, at the grace that we don't deserve. Thank you, Jesus. Begin to thank the Lord, church. Just focus your attention on Him. Give Him your worship, a sacrifice of praise.
This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. They would take my place. They would bear my cross.
troubled sea When the cares of this world darken my day You are the light that shines and shows me the way And oh, the beauty of your majesty
to stand to our feet and just worship the Lord for a minute. Great are you, O Lord Most High. take all of us, Jesus, we pray. Lord, we are desperate for you. Lord, as we said on Sunday in 1 John, we confess that, Lord, we don't meet the standard, but we believe in the gospel and we know that Jesus not only is worthy, he's provided, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, but Lord, the key to a perfecting, perfected life and so we humble ourselves and we say, God, help. We see your holiness tonight. Lord, we, we just kind of commune with your purity, Lord, your, your righteousness. And we say, Lord, we pray, God, that, um, Lord, we don't have it, but you do. And we want it. And we ask because you'll give it, Lord. You say, be holy as I'm holy. God, make me holy as you're holy. Set me apart, Lord, uh, to you. I pray in my marriage, in my home, with my kids and my co-workers, certainly in my church, God. We said on Sunday we need love. Lord, give us love tonight. Fill me with agape love, Lord. I, I can't live without it. Thank you for those prayers. As we said, God, that uh, you will answer. According to your will, God, you will answer. So hear our humility, Lord, see our brokenness, our desperation, our hunger and thirst for Jesus, and meet your people, God. It's not, uh, Lord, mystical or weird. It's the power of prayer, and we pray, God. We ask our Father, Lord, just to help us and strengthen us and be a bigger part of our life. Lord, we thank you for worship, God. We thank you for your presence here with us, Lord. So refreshing us, as your word says. God, give us, if we're worshipers, Lord, as we're worshipers, Lord, let us delight, Lord, worship you by studying your word tonight. Uh, we thank you, God, we love you. Lord, as we invite you to be a bigger part of our life, Lord, make your word a more important priority in our lives as we'll see tonight. We thank you, God. We love you, Jesus. We could go on and on tonight, it seems. And we love it. Hallelujah, Lord. In Jesus' name, as the lights come on, let's say together, Amen. And we say, Amen. God is good. All the time. That's how that goes. God is good. All the time. It's true. <laughs> let's turn around, spend a few minutes greeting each other. We'll begin our Bible study. Well, if anybody needs a Bible, why don't you go ahead and raise your hand. Deuteronomy chapter 31, we continue our course. Only a few studies left here through the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Again, if you don't have a Bible in your lap, electronically or 
with paper, you know, that kind of thing. I still love books. Raise your hand and one of our sweet ushers, I love these guys, will pass you a Bible to use for tonight. I want to make sure you hear the announcement, spread the word for this essentials class that we're doing six weeks on Sunday morning during the first service. It'll kind of like be an adult Sunday school kind of thing. Essentials for the Christian life, and this will be a a fantastic opportunity. So, uh, make sure you make that a priority. Spread the word. I think it is for everybody. Um, And so, make it a point to be a part of that. You can attend the class first service and then come to second service. That'd be my recommendation for you. Amen. You passed a table on the way in full of baby bottles. Make sure and take one of those with you. We love to support the Alternatives um, Pregnancy Crisis Center here in Sacramento for a long time, for over just about as long as we've been here, which we just celebrated 12 years, by the way. Amen. Good good evening. Good evening. Twelve years. Praise God. Uh, and we love these guys. In fact, they'll be with us a couple Sundays from now, kind of sharing a little bit about their ministry. Um, think the world of it. And so be a part of that. You can take that little baby bottle and however, wherever, at work or, you know, in the, the home or whatever, go door to door and, and fill that thing up with change and dollar bills and we can support and bless that ministry. Amen. Amen. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 31, Deuteronomy 31, excited to continue in worship through the Word. So good to be gathered together. Best thing we could do on a Wednesday night, I think. Amen. Love you guys. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful to open your word together tonight. We thank you that only it is a light and a lamp unto our feet directing our path, telling us where to go and what to avoid. Lord, you've given us wisdom. You've given us your word. And Lord, even when you know that we will reject it, we're going to pretend to receive it and then go and do contrary to it. That's what we see here in Deuteronomy 31. You deliver it anyway. You're such a gracious God because you know that we'll remember it and we'll repent from our waywardness and our foolishness, and you'll be ready. And you want us to remember that you are ready to receive us and forgive us. You make no bargains with sin. It's all or nothing. It's repentance or separation. You won't lie to us about what sin is, what it does, what it brings. You say, leave it and love me. And that's the only way, God, we're going to find fellowship with you. Lord, even as I say those words, it's refreshing to hear them in our generation. A generation that just won't say it straight when it comes to sin. What has separated you from me, me from you? Lord, we know it's our sin. And so help us to be, Lord, a a culture as a church, a culture as Christians that understand what sin is and what it does. And certainly that the price for our sin has been paid through Jesus and by faith and trust in who He is and what He's done, we can receive forgiveness, Lord, through repentance. But also continual cleansing, God, from our stumblings as believers. Raise us up as a grateful people, so grateful for grace that it keeps us clean, we pray. Thank you for your people. Thank you for those watching and listening online with us tonight. Bless them, Lord, as we work our way through your word. In Jesus' name, let's say together, Amen Amen and Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 31. It's good to have David back. Everybody look at him. His head's like hanging above the wall back in the sound booth. You see him back there? Good to have David back from visiting some family. God bless uh, all of those that have been so sick and are continuing to deal with all this cold and flu. Keep uh, your brothers and sisters in prayer. Amen. 
Well, we know that we're coming to a close, the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is standing in front of the nation, some three million plus people. They're preparing to enter into the promised land uh, and ensuring that they would enter in and do well, live long, multiply, and just enjoy God's enduring blessing. Moses as a father, uh, a man filled with mercy. Uh, he's just pouring out his heart to this people, reminding them of their tendencies, warning them about how they can be, speaking prophetically, but it, for mostly just, just repeating to them the word of the Lord and just exhorting them over and over and over again to stay in the word, stick with the word. Don't forget God's word because if you do, you will fall away. Period. We see that again in Deuteronomy 31, amongst many other things. And we see in Deuteronomy 31 that we're headed for a close. Uh, Moses is preparing to, well, move on, literally, uh, physically, uh, as we'll see in this chapter. He's appointing Joshua. He's passing uh, the reins of leadership to his disciple, this young protege. And he's going to go and be with the Lord ultimately. Let's tear this apart. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 31. We're almost done. Then Moses, wrapping up this 34 chapters of teaching and preaching, this message that he's delivered, Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also, or foremostly, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. Uh, how many of us complain about our age? I have to confess, you know I do it. I, I'm tempted to do it sometimes. And it's ridiculous. I know you can laugh at me and mock me. I'm a young man, everybody says, and whatever. We complain about our age. You got nothing on Moses. 120 years old. He's been walking every step through this wilderness with God's wayward people, uh, being a mediator uh, between God to them, blessing, serving, being an example. And he sort of says here in the first two verses, you're going in and I'm not coming with you. And that's why, remember tonight, that's why Moses is pleading. And I know the book of Deuteronomy has, has been very repetitious, right? I mean, over and over and over and over again, we've seen much of the same thing. But that's why. Can you, can you, <clears throat> pardon me, can you remember that tonight? Repetition is key. Repetitiousness is healthy. Amen? Because we're a people prone to forget God's Word. We have a will that works against us. Why is it that I can remember any song lyric I've ever heard? Music lick or TV joke, you say, right? But I can't remember the Bible. Listen, you have a physical body, a flesh that fights against anything good or of God. And so repetitiousness is key. And so Moses is just over and over again pouring out his heart. He as a father, uh, 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 in so many ways, the father of this nation, having led them, spoon-fed them, and so on and so forth for 40 years, he's leaving them. So would he be a little, you know, long-winded? Yes. Would he appeal and plead and, 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 and in every way that he could seek to reach them, uh, knowing that he's leaving them? Yes. Moses is staying there going, and so he's pleading. He's pouring out his heart. I like that he says, verse 2, he points out his age, but as you examine this text, you can see so clearly that his age isn't an issue. It's not his age that's preventing him from going with them. He's not retiring. That's it for me, boys. No, in fact, his heart's broken because this is everything his whole life has led up to. God placed a heart within him to free these people, this nation, from the slavery, the bondage of, of Egypt. You know, a lot of issues and some failures there. Uh, forty years in Pharaoh's courts, forty years out being a shepherd, and then, well, the last forty years of his life are kind of getting exciting as he's, you know, let my people go and that whole kind of thing, right? Right? Come on, little, little, little Ten Commandments there. Don't forget that movie. I think it's great. I can't remember the dude's name. Help me out. Help me out. 
Charlton Heston, love that guy, come on. Have a little bit of fun at any rate. He's given his life, his heart to these people. He can't go. He's bummed. It's not retirement that I'm seeking. I think a good minister of the Lord, uh, uh, certainly a pastor, never retires. What, we just can't do this anymore? I don't know. Maybe that's for some. That's not the example that I've seen and, and, and that I am impressed by and that I seek to follow after. Uh, when the Lord takes me home, when my work is done, that's when I, I retire and I pray I'm able to do that. Amen? We use age as an excuse sometimes when our ministry doesn't have to change. It doesn't have to end. No, that's not the reason that I'm staying and you're going. And as he says, verse 2, the Lord has said to me, and you know if you've been with us. You shall not cross over this Jordan. You don't get to go with my people into my promises. This land flowing with milk and honey, an incredible blessing. It's physical blessing for Israel. It's prophetic, you know, in its application even to you and me to enter into God's rest. I mean, the promised land. There's so much there as we've discussed. Moses knows that. Maybe more than anyone else in this company, Moses knows knows it, and he doesn't get to go into and enjoy it. Now, if we're hearing this for the first time, and maybe we need a reminder tonight, why is God preventing Moses from going? Everything he's worked toward, all that he's invested in, hoped and dreamed of, and so on and so forth. Why is this punishment uh, laid upon Moses? You shall not cross over this Jordan with the rest of my people. We remember, and you can write this down, Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, God's people as they're wandering around the wilderness are complaining again, right? You never complain, right? I never complain, of course not. But these guys, you know, these Israelites, from whom we learn so much about ourselves, we see so much of ourselves, I pray, are complaining again. Give us water, we're thirsty, you let us out here to kill us, let's go back to Egypt because slavery was super fun. Right? I mean, just remember this and think it through again for just a moment. Kind of the silliness, the absurdity of our complaining oftentimes. It doesn't make sense. It's not legit. It's not right. We, we have to forsake the Word of God and all His promises in order to complain at all. And that's what they were doing. And Moses got mad. Moses got frustrated. Go back and read all about it. And I'm paraphrasing a bit here for the sake of time. But you remember what he said? Uh, you rebels! And he raised his voice and began to rant and rave at God's people. Shall we including himself with God, go and get water for you and da-da-da. He kind of goes on a bit of a rage, a little tirade, misrepresenting God, disobeying the word of the Lord. Because God said something very specific. Hey, they're my people. I love them. I know they're thirsty. I'm going to provide water for them to drink. That's what I do. I'm a faithful father. Speak to the rock. You remember? Speak. And what he was supposed to say, I don't know. How about you? Water. Rock. I, I, I don't know. We're not told. You can ask Moses in heaven someday. But God said, speak to the rock. You remember prior to that, when the same sort of scene happened, God said to Moses, strike the rock and water will come out. We're seeing a, a prophetic picture here. And God's like setting a plan in history pointing to Jesus Christ. And we know that because Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians 10. I think Jesus spoke of this in John 7, verse 37. Strike the rock. Life, water will flow. If any man thirsts, Jesus said, let him come to me and drink, right? Out of his heart will flow torrents of living water. This is great. We're seeing a picture here. Strike it, because Jesus only died once, right? Once and for all. For all sin. So, this second time comes around. They're at Meribah, Numbers 20. Moses is frustrated. God said, speak to the rock. Why? Because we, we speak. We call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, right? I love that, don't you? Jesus. That can be salvation right then, right there. Blows our mind, right? And that's good. Keep us in our place, right? We get a little too comfortable, I, I think, saying um, 
things that God will and won't do. Unless His Word specifically speaks against it, we need to be careful. We close the door of salvation oftentimes, rather than kind of celebrate how glorious the grace of God is. We know what salvation looks like, but when it comes, boom, when it happens, we don't know, do we? Only God does. We can see the fruit, the evidence, as we're studying through 1 John. But it's amazing to me. That's a gospel I want to preach. Jesus, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What does that say to you? That's God's Word. It says a lot. Amen? I love it. It's a narrow way. Just Jesus. Amen? But... Wow, how simple, how easy. Speak the word and salvation can come. That's what God wanted to say there at Meribah. But Moses, he was mad. How many of you have gotten angry? I do all the time. Frustrated, you know, with the kids or the sheep or... (laughs) And we're tempted, aren't we? To let them have it, to let loose a little bit, to kind of step up on a soapbox and say, man, you're making God and I really angry right now. That's what Moses did, and, and we've been there, I've been there, but it's not good. And so he misrepresented the Lord, he struck that rock, God in his grace, water flowed, the people drank, right? But God pulled Moses aside and, and had words with him, amen? You know, God has words with your pastor, you know. You as shepherds and ministers and pastors, God has pulled you aside and said, "Uh, the Holy Spirit has laid some weight on your heart until you repented of that inappropriate action. Amen? Amen. And I pray we do. Heard a story from a, a, a pastor friend this week of that very thing. Laid it on a little too thick one Sunday morning or whatever, he said. And he was, man, the heavy hand of the Lord, he said, was on my heart that whole, that whole week until I came clean and I repented. And I said, that was wrong. That was me talking and not God's Word, not His Holy Spirit. But we can get caught up emotionally in the moment, can't we? And we need to be careful. Our best intentions, man, they're no good at all if they're not founded upon God's holy word, as we'll see shortly. Amen? And so Moses blew it. God pulled him aside and said, Listen, I'm gracious, I'm good, you're not going to die or anything, but you're not going to go in. You're not going to enter into the promised land. James chapter 3, verse 1, you know the verse, uh, says, Let not many of you become teachers, for they shall receive a stricter judgment. Right? There's a higher standard of accountability for those who want to represent God, who want to speak His Word, who want to teach the Bible. There's a higher standard. If you won't set that uh, 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 high standard as your aim, your goal, to maintain that above reproach kind of lifestyle, you have no business being in ministry, being in front of anybody. Um, by way of leadership, bearing that authority. If you won't make that your aim and your prayer, God, I see what you say. Teachers receive a stricter form of judgment. That scares me to death, but this is what you've called me to do, so help me walk circumspectly, uh, uh, live an above-reproach kind of lifestyle. I've seen them, and you have too. Those who don't take that very seriously, and they need to get out of the ministry. Because that's the calling. This is the standard by which we're judged. Pastors aren't perfect. Don't expect them to be. Uh, A lot of misunderstanding there too. Amen? But understanding that there's a stricter sort of lifestyle that applies. It should scare us all a little bit to death. Some would say, well, why get into the ministry at all then? And to that I say, well, I, I don't really have a choice in the matter. I could go do something else, but this is what God's called me to do, and so it would be disobedient. So yes, the standard is there, and that's a scary thing. But nonetheless, it's His grace that sustains us. Amen? So we're observing Moses' life coming to an end. You're going in, I'm not coming with you. But look at what he says here. I love this section, verses 3 through 6. The Lord your God Himself, you're going, I'm not following. I'm not leading you anymore. But look at what he says, reassuring his people. 
The Lord your God Himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua Himself. And we'll get to him in just a moment, verses 7 and 8. Joshua Himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and their land when he destroyed them. You remember that? The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I've commanded you. Moses is speaking to the people. Look at the Lord. Consider that it's God who goes with you, even though I'm not. He says, verse 6, be strong. Can we read this verse out loud? Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Great section of Scripture to chew on for a minute. Moses was good, right? I mean, come on, incredible leader. He like messed up once. That's, that's a great track record. You know, always falling on his face uh, before the Lord. and I, I mean, just incredible. It doesn't really get much better than Moses when it comes to a man who leads God's people. Moses was good, but what does Moses say here? God is going with you. God is so far greater than I could ever be. And now it's a change, and we struggle with change, don't we? But it's God in reality. Joshua, sure, we'll get to him in a minute. But don't be afraid. Be of good courage. Be strong, he says. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. I'm staying here, but God is uh, going with you, going before you. You get God, even though I'm staying put. You know, we're an interesting people as Christians. We see ourselves in, in Israel oftentimes. We see ourselves presently and in church history. We don't do well with changes in leadership, do we? When a new pastor comes in or the old pastor goes out and people freak out and the church you know, barely survives that kind of you know, exchange or whatever the case may be. We're a people who, sad to say, uh, have their eyes on the man in front of them as opposed to the man who's above them. Amen? And I think I see, if you don't mind uh, me sharing for a moment, uh, I think I see that the most clearly when people step out in ministry. You know, and, and I've, I've gone both ways with this. You know, you're kind of like, because you care about people and you love them, and, and so you coddle them, and you're like, how you doing? You're starting this Bible study. How's it going? I'm praying for you. I love you. And you're like sending emails. You're like, yeah. And then other times, because you realize that doesn't, you know, really work. Other times you're like, okay, you know, I'm just going to trust the Lord and, and just exhort them, keep your eyes on the Lord, da-da-da-da-da. You know, it's just an interesting experience. Um, you can't force a person to do what Moses exhorting is exhorting these people to do here. Get your eyes on God. It's not about me. He's the one who goes before you. He's the one who's with you. So get up and get going. Cross the Jordan. Get your feet wet. Pick a fight with these other nations. God will show up. He'll fight for you. He'll deliver you. You're not going to feel it. You know how we want that feeling in place of faith? Moses is saying, exercise some faith. God's going to go with you. You're not going to feel it. You're not going to necessarily see Him because the, the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke stops here. But He's going with you. It's called faith. I don't feel it, really. But by faith I trust, I know, I believe God's Word. And if I will let God sort of refine that faith, I will see Him. I will feel Him in so many ways. He will be faithful. It's tough. You know, Calvary Chapel, to give you a little additional insight, has kind of a philosophy of ministry. It's not like a sink or swim thing, but it kind of is. 
And I'll tell you a story. Someone approached my wife. She was hanging out with someone or something. And another pastor's wife from a different you know, church or denomination uh, spoke with her a little bit. And, and anytime we hear from like you know, other pastors, God bless them, and, and other ministries and whatnot, they always kind of have a sense that to be a Calvary Chapel pastor is really hard like, because you kind of get thrown in the deep end. Like, that's kind of the philosophy. You're very quiet right now, just staring at me. That's kind of the philosophy of ministry, and I respect it so much. I appreciate it so much, um, and others do as well. I'm not trying to boast in Calvary Chapel, just illustrate a point. But, you know, if God's in this, you're going to have to go figure that out. And if you can't have your eyes on the Lord, if you can't trust God and develop some faith, if you're going to lean on anything or anyone else, it's probably not going to work. And so go and start something. Go and do something. Follow the Lord's leading. Abide in His calling. And you will do well. You'll see the Lord. You'll, You'll feel the Lord. The fruit will be evident. But that's a tough thing. Ask missionaries who kind of go out and they feel alone. But they're not alone, are they? You only learn to lean on the Lord uh, when you can't really lean on anyone or anything else. Have you been there? You will be, I hope. And it's such an important thing. It's such a good reminder. Get your eyes off me, Moses says. It's not about me. Get your eyes on God. He's going with you. He's for you. He's going to fight for you. I would like to say more, but I'll leave that for you to consider later. And then Moses, verse 7 and verse 8, that being said, kind of turns his attention to Joshua. Uh, 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 Moses is moving on. Uh, Joshua is being sort of, uh, this is his inauguration as the new leader of the Lord's army here. Verse 7, Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, much of the same thing, right? Let's read this together again. Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. Count how many charges he gives here. You, you, he says. Verse 8, And the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Joshua, you're the one the Lord chose, so get up. Go now, cross the Jordan, get your feet wet. As we said a moment ago, pick a fight and watch God be faithful. Get up and go. You shall cause them to inherit it. You must go uh, with this people. I like that. You know, we just talked about how oftentimes when we go out, we go alone, but we know God is with us. We feel afraid, but God's building faith. But now Moses reminds us here of another very important uh, aspect or element of Christianity, certainly of ministry. God is the one who fights the battles. God is the one who does the work. God is the one who gets all the glory. God will go before you. God will fight for you. And, And every other thing that we just said, but make no mistake, mark this here, precious people. God will go. God will do. But God chooses to use men to do His work. And what we're looking at, what we're remembering here, is the reality that God wants to partner with people to do what He does. God's going to do it. Uh, He's responsible. He gets all the glory. But listen, God picks people to work through. Don't ask me why. Right? I mean, we we could throw out a few things, but it's a mystery even still. I don't know why. I kind of have a couple guesses. But the reality that God wants to partner with me to do what He does blows my mind. It blesses me like crazy. But it, for mostly, I think, inspires me. As Joshua was to be inspired as Moses is charging him here. And we forget this, I think, oftentimes in the ministry. You know, we have this attitude of of something like this. Well, let go and let God, brother. You know, just just go like this, and the, the Holy Spirit will take over, and He'll like... 
praise the Lord, or he'll like, he'll just do it for you. I've never seen that work in real life. How about you? Just just let go and, and go for it in God. Or You know how we kind of throw out those cliches? Well, I'm just trusting the Lord. I'm going to just jump on a plane. I don't know where. I'm going to go to the airport and just say, give me the next flight out. I'm just going to trust the Lord. I don't know who I'm going to you know, preach to or what language they speak. Or I'm just going to, I'm just going to trust that everything's going to be okay. Um, okay? Like Moses, you know, oftentimes we want to instill this important reminder. God chooses people to partner with to do His work, and those people must work with the Lord to do what He wants to do. There's such a lazy spirit in, in the ministry oftentimes because we don't remember that we'll be the ones swinging the sword and, and, and serving the saints and leading the charge. And that's laborious and that's tough and that's difficult. First one on the field, last one off the field, you know? That's what the work of the ministry is. That's what leadership is. That's what God blesses. This laziness that oftentimes we see in the ministry, it's, it's, it's inappropriate and it won't bear fruit. That's kind of the point. God just won't bless that. And, and for the most part, um, that's what we see in real life. Those who take a lackadaisical approach to God's calling. Um, I think in, in so many ways you're going to see um, what you put in. God's going to bless what you put forth. And frankly, if I'm not going to put my all into what I'm doing for the Lord in the first place, I don't think He should bless it. That's a dangerous place to be, amen? God will bless you, I think, as you're going and doing what He's called you to do, but diligence is the key. It's, it's, it's hard work. Moses reminds Joshua. He doesn't say, let go and let God. I'm just trusting that, you know, everything's going to work out. He says, you are responsible for these people. So go and fight and work and labor. Because God will bless that. Amen? Diligence is the key. Do not fear or be dismayed, he said. The Lord will bless as you put forth that effort. Verse 9. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. Heard again this week great controversy uh, uh, as to who wrote the book of Deuteronomy. Well, let it be settled. Let the question be answered. The problem solved. So Moses wrote this law, right? You're, you're getting that Bible joke? Yeah, we know exactly who wrote the book of Moses, or pardon me, Deuteronomy, because it was Moses, because it says right here, Deuteronomy 31, verse 9. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which He chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones. Love those little ones. Ones. And the stranger who's within your gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn to fear the Lord, your God, and carefully observe all the words of this law. And that their children who have not known it may hear, take an essentials class, and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which the uh, pardon me which you cross the Jordan to possess. Take this word uh, of the Lord. Take this law, uh, priests. You're responsible to dispense it, to disperse it nationally every seven years at this feast. As all Israel's commanded to come together, you're going to read the word of the Lord. You're going to read the Bible, as it were. You're going to instruct in righteousness so that God's people can live according to 
his word and reap the promises, avoid the curses. Those who don't know, those who haven't heard, the stranger, the kids who are ignorant. They can hear the word of the Lord and live. We covered in Deuteronomy 17 that every king of Israel was to write out for himself the word of the Lord and have his own copy. Stay in the word. Stick with the scriptures. Know the Bible. And you'll do well, God says, verse 12 and verse 13. You'll continue in it. You can't continue in it if you don't know it, if you aren't in it. It's not going to happen. So to the priests have a responsibility that Moses gives them here to disperse and to dispense the word of the Lord. And we know, and we've covered this before, that the priests were to scatter themselves across Israel, uh, that every kind of community would have a priest to teach and declare the word of the Lord. And this is so very essential. We see God's commandment again here nationally, but we also see His wisdom personally. And that is His wisdom for you and me. Stay in the Word. Stick with the Scriptures. And you'll do well. How is a nation supposed to continue walking obediently before the Lord? Uh, Again, enjoying His blessing, avoiding the consequences of idolatry and sin. Uh, by staying in the word of the Lord. How can a nation stay right with God, abide in His blessing, if they aren't in the word? They can't. And the same is true for us, every one of us, our kids in our families. How are our children going to know the Lord, fear the Lord, walk with the Lord, enjoy the blessings of the Lord, and not the consequences of sin? If the Word doesn't have a, a, a you know prevailing part of our lives, where we sit down and, and crack open the Bible in the morning around the table, or if that doesn't work, uh, before bed we come and we sit down and we open the Bible and we read and we give instruction in righteousness. How do we expect to make it at all if we aren't in the Bible? We won't. We won't. A couple of interesting facts for you in regard to Israel. Moses is saying, stay with the Word, stick with the Scriptures. Three recorded times did Israel do this, fulfill this law, reading the Word every seven years. Joshua chapter 8 verse 20, we'll get there. As they cross over into the Jordan, things are good and exciting, fresh. The feast arrives and the word is read and it's glorious, right? They didn't do this for another 500 years. 2 Chronicles 17 verse 7. From Joshua 8 entering in 500 years later, well, they got together and read the Bible again. And they may have come together more often, but this is what the Scripture records. And we have to think that, well, this is what the Scripture records for a reason. How well did the nation do in the meantime? Terribly. Poorly. Right? Didn't do well at all. The next time was 250 years later, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 30. So once... Soon, Joshua 8, 500 years later, and then another 250 years later, Israel, you know, read the Bible. Came together nationally every seven years, you know, as we're reading here. God's commandment for the nation. Come together, read the Bible. Stick with the Scriptures. You'll do well. You'll know, and, and, and so too you'll do. Didn't do it very often, and what was the result? It was terrible. Wait till we get to the book of Judges. I mean... It's, Wow, every man doing what's right in his own eyes. It was terrible. And it was up and down and up and down. Good kings and bad kings and terrible times. And it was just, it's it's a sad story, the history of Israel, isn't it? All because they didn't stick with the scriptures. They didn't stay in the Bible. They didn't do it because they didn't know it. And they didn't know it because they didn't bother to read it. How can we think that our families are going to make it, that our kids are going to be raised without being destroyed by the world? Destroyed. And it's hard to not share sometimes. You know, it's such an awkward thing. Uh, What's going on in our ministry presently, but it'd be inappropriate. 
But I tell you this, over and over and over and over and over again, somehow we think, well, my kids wouldn't get caught up in that or my kids wouldn't be a part of that. Um, If we're teaching them the Word, there's a good chance they won't. They may. God help us. God be with us. God give us wisdom. But I tell you this with certainty, if we're not exposing them to God's Word regularly, daily if possible, then you can expect them to be (laughs) claimed, destroyed by the world because the world is wicked. Satan is hungry for our kids. He wants to claim them and destroy them. And the only thing that stands between him and them is you and me. Amen? Stay in the Bible. Stick with the Scripture. You like that there's like nothing else here? Just read the Bible. He says, that's the solution. Not more powerful preaching. I'll throw the pulpit off the stage and we'll get loud and wild and put on a show. No special oil or gold dust in the vents, angel feathers fallen, madness, nonsense. It's not your pastor. It's the Bible. It's the Scripture. Don't you love that? It's not about Moses. It's not about Joshua. It's about the Word of the Lord. Get it, Get in the Bible, Moses says. Read it aloud that they may hear, that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law. And that that would be passed on from generation to generation. I'm not a... I'm I'm a, I'm a perpetual optimist. I'm always glass full, half full. But I tell you, I'm really scared sometimes about uh, the generation of kids that kind of sit before us. That problem is yours and mine. That's our responsibility to teach and train and walk with and, and warn. And, you know, whatever we can do, we are accountable for those kids. And it is not looking good in our country at this time. And so, Lord, just help us, sober us up a little bit. It's not, you know, surmountable, insurmountable. It's um, uh, a simple teaching and, and reading of the Bible. That's what we do. Amen? Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, right? How can you hide it if you don't know it? <laughs> we said earlier, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Well, you've got to have it in order for it to do that, right? We'll get back to that maybe in just a moment. We'll try and wrap this up. Verse 14, this is the last section of the chapter. Let's read. Then the Lord said to Moses, again, this is Moses' retirement, truly, and Joshua's inauguration here. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of meeting that I may inaugurate him. I love that. I was ordained by Pastor George. And that was super cool. Have a picture and everything. Joshua is getting ordained by God. Isn't this great? I like this. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Now, the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And God speaks here. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers. Encouraging, incredibly encouraging. And then it kind of gets a little negative from here. This is an interesting sort of inauguration. It doesn't seem very inspiring. Uh, That is until we see the grace that God is about to speak over His people. Two things we see in this passage, if you want to write it down. First of all, the prediction of failure. The prediction of failure. And that's incredible. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we also see here the promise of grace. A prediction of failure. uh, And with that, a promise of grace through repentance. Moses, you're going to rest with your fathers, literally. And this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. 
Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. And I will surely hide my face in that day, because of all the evil which they have done, and that they have turned to other gods. Now... Therefore, I love this. This is great. Moses, write down this song for yourselves. And we'll study that next time. It's in chapter 32. The grace of God. I want you to remember my word, so I'm going to communicate it in a way that you can't forget. I want to speak a message of grace that there's repentance. I want to give you a song so you can recall it and and find your way back to me after you come to your senses having strayed into sin. This is great. Now therefore, write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. When I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they've eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, prosperity... Oftentimes it's our downfall. Then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as a witness. For it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants, for I know the inclination of their behavior today, even before I have brought them to the land of which I swore to them. A song of grace, we'll see next time. A song of repentance, of of righteousness. God is right. He's perfect. And this deal, as we said last Wednesday, this covenant's a good covenant. Nothing wrong with it. Israel would break it. But as we celebrated last week, God would be gracious. Deuteronomy 30, it was wonderful. Planning ahead of time for their return to Him to show grace and to shower blessing upon them. And some of that we still have yet to see in regard to God's promises to Israel. Some of it we we have seen, we will see here in the Old Testament. As often as they came back, God was right there, having turned from their sin. Beautiful, wonderful words of grace. I love it. I'm going to give them a song. I'm going to write it, God says. Moses, you're going to record it. Because songs are catchy, right? you love this? I can't help but think like of children's ministry because God says, I'm writing a song. I'm going to give it to you. Your kids are never going to forget it. They're going to sing it and say it. And boy, it's true with our kids, you know. There's some things uh, cleverly inserted into their, I don't know, subconscious or memory and they just never forget, do they? God says, I'm going to get you. And I love this. I'm going to sow something so deep into your heart. I'm going to speak of grace so that you never forget you have a way back, a way out of sin, and it's through repentance. God makes no bargains with sin. I was listening to a message from Pastor Chuck, Pastor Chuck Smith. He's with Jesus now. Praise God. He's retired as well. A little little church, little Pastor Chuck joke there. But I was so blessed because he was speaking very straight about sin. And filled with grace, filled with love, as he always was, just speaking about sin and the reality of sin and, 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 and kind of sharing from his heart. I don't ever want you to come here and be comfortable in your sin. I want you to be convicted. I don't want to communicate. I don't want to impart that anything, any sin you're living in right now is acceptable. It's not. We see that so clearly here. We see the uh, sin defined. We see how sin separates us from God. That's important. And as we said last week, we defined covenant so clearly last week. And that's important. Because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sin, if we're saved, if we're born again. But again, as we're learning through 1 John, amen? Something ain't right with the one who says, I love the Lord and I live in sin. Sorry. It's not right. It's unacceptable. It's not going to work. And I'm thankful for 1 John for that reason. 
the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The picture of the prodigal again comes to mind. Spit in the face of his father, I wish you were dead, give me the money that I'm going to get when you go. And he went and left the father and blew it all, living literally, you know, in sin, but remembered the kindness, the grace of his father and got up and left. That iniquity, that sin, that pig pen came back and was warmly welcomed, restored, got more than he ever had before. And that's what God has been teaching his people here. But again, that departure from sin is vital. Do not ever think for a second you can get right with God while living in sin. Never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Don't be deceived. Don't be deluded. Don't think that we can, or, or God will accept sin. Well, I guess I'll, you know, embrace you and love you and accept that sin. Nope. It's never going to happen. And anyone who says otherwise is a liar. God says, ah, I'm going to get you. I'm going to insert a song in your subconscious and you're going to sing it and you're going to remember and you're going to repent. You're going to turn from sin and come back to me and then you'll enjoy my blessing again. Therefore, verse 22, let's wrap it up. Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. Then he inaugurated Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them. And I will be with you. I love it. Be strong, he says to Joshua here. Be strong, and you can write this down, so that you will not be swayed. Why do we need to be strong as leaders, as parents? As pastors, Paul said the same thing to Timothy. Be strong in the grace of God. Why do we need to be strong? Because we're a people that are easily swayed. We're swayed oftentimes by our own wicked hearts. We're also swayed by the opinions and appeals of other people, aren't we? Doesn't mean we shouldn't listen to counsel. But for mostly, we should listen to this Bible. And not be swayed by the opinion of anybody if it contradicts the Scripture. So be strong. Remember Aaron? Make us a God of gold, the people said. He said, okay. <laughs> he wasn't strong. Didn't have good courage. Not qualified to lead. Moses led. Joshua would lead. Don't be swayed. Be strong, Moses says to Joshua here. And then we wrap it up, verse 24, as our time is leaving us. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments went inside. This word of the law went beside the Ark of the Covenant, that it may be there as a witness against you, for I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I am yet alive, you've been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death, my departure? Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke Him to anger through the work of your hands. And we'll continue next time with this song that Moses says, Come, children, sit around. Listen to the song that God has given me for you. Um, um, uh, 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 that it may keep you from wandering, from going astray. But even as you so choose to do, uh, that this grace would compel you, remind you that you can always come back with repentance. Amen. God, help us to be a people, Lord, that clearly understand what sin is, and for mostly it separates us from you. Lord, help us to see so clearly, Lord, as your word makes it uh, crystal clear, Lord, that you make no bargains, no deals, and neither should we with sin. Lord, what separated me from you? It's your sin, God, you told us. And so, Lord, let us be a, a people that practices righteousness, that prays, Lord, sticks with the Scripture that we can keep ourselves clean, Lord, and when that stumbling occurs, that 
we would be quick to repent, to turn from our sin and run right back to You, knowing that You're gracious and You're merciful and You'll receive us as we, if we repent of that sin. God, we live in a culture that says sin doesn't matter and sin is genetic and all these other things. And Lord, we know that Your Word declares so very simply Lord, that sin can be turned from, repented of. We can see consistency in our life and our walk with You. And that's what we desire. That's what we pray for. And so in Your grace, keep us. In Your grace, bless us, Lord, as Lord, we make it our profession and our practice to live for You in public and in private. Lord, just um, bear that good fruit of righteousness. Lord, as we see grace tonight, Lord, let Your grace keep us and Your love compel us to... Um, to walk closely to You. God, keep us in Your Word. Let us be a culture that just continues to celebrate this Bible, to teach our kids to raise up this next generation. Lord, to stand strong in this world, Lord, of wickedness. Give us wisdom. Bless Your people. Bless our kids, Lord, as we do all these things, having heard them so, so very clearly. In Jesus' name, let's say together. Amen. And we say, Amen. Amen. If you'd like any prayer, come on up. Some elders and... Ushers will be up front. God bless them. Enjoy some fellowship before you go. God bless.